okay, yep, I think I, I think that should be working from here. All right, so um, look, welcome everyone, um, people who are here in person, small in number, but mighty in spirit. And, um, and we've got a lot of people who are joining us online, which um, is, is really terrific. So thank you, welcome everyone. Um, so my name is Victoria Stead. Um, I am one of the editors with Melinda Hinkson of the newly published book, uh, beyond Global Food Supply Chains, Crisis, Disruption, Regeneration, which uh, forms something of an anchor for this session today. So I just want to begin by uh, acknowledging the Jakakai, Irukandji and Gumayudinji people as the traditional owners of the lands on which we are gathered here in Cairns um, and the owners of the waters that surround us uh, to extend respects to their elders and ancestors and to acknowledge that sovereignty over this country was never ceded. Um, and I want to acknowledge as well the need for us to recognise colonialism as a really fundamental force in producing the inequities and violences that shape the global food system today. And to acknowledge the enduring strength of Indigenous knowledge, practice and care for country and the alternate relations of food provision and nourishment that they sustain. So I will introduce our speakers very briefly in just a minute, but before yeah. we do, I'm just gonna pass over. Uh, yeah, I don't know how your work fits with resource extractions either. Do you think it's the work that you've been doing with farm? Or do you think? Yeah, I don't know, that, that confuses not... me. Um, yeah, I would say though, like, uh, yeah, that's a bit confusing. I mean, you've already said you don't wanna do it. If you decide maybe that you wanna like ask me more about Laura, can we please ask you to mute your microphone? Okay, thank you. So because we have got a bit of a hybrid um, in-person Zoom format going on, so it's going to be really important that everyone who is not speaking, please do keep yourself on mute throughout the session. Look, before we kick off, I'm just going to pass over very quickly to, um, to Catherine, who's going to do a little bit of a spruik for another of the sessions in this series. So just to flag, this event um, right now is part of a series of hybrid events that are being put on by um, URSA. Um, for, as part of this World Congress of Rural Sociology in, um, in partnership with RC40, which is the Food and Agriculture Research Committee of the International Sociological Association, also the Australasian Agri-Food Network. And um, this session is also being co-hosted with the Institute for Postcolonial Studies. I'm just gonna have a really quick um, pass over to share some information about one of the other sessions, and then we will we'll jump back into it. Thank you so much. I'm just going to be really short and say that we also have a fantastic session that's organized in about um, two and a half hours. It will also be hybrid. It's on digital agriculture, and that's going to be a panel that includes uh, Kelly Bronson, Stephen Wolf, Jean Wee, and uh, Simon Fielke, and myself. And, um, and the first part will be a panel, which will be really brief, and then we're going to be having a workshop. So it's going to be kind of a, a really productive session, and uh, we would love for you to join that session as well, if you're available. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so what we're going to do today in terms of, um, of format is we're going to have a number of really short, kind of short, snappy presentations. And these are all contributors, some of the many contributors to, to the book. I do hope you will download it. It's open access. The QR code there on the slide will get you to it. Um, otherwise, I think we'll pop the, the link in the chat. And there are also some hard copy flyers floating up the back of the room here in Cairns. Um, so I'm going to kick off um, and then we'll, we'll run through the speakers in the order that they're there on the slides. We'll speak for about five or so minutes each and then the idea really is that we'll be able to open it up for conversation um, with everyone, with pre uh, presenters and everyone who's joining us as well as part of the audience. So global food supply chains, we have been told often in recent years are in crisis. 
Uh, beginning in March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic's uh, myriad impacts on human life have included dramatic and far-reaching distribution uh, disruptions to global food systems. Border closures triggered uh, critical labour shortages for crop harvesting, outbreaks of infection spread through abattoirs and processing facilities, panic buying cleared supermarket shelves, uh, the precariousness of hospitality and gig economy work has been amplified. And of course, Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine is prompting new narratives of crisis uh, with delays, price hikes and shortages as oil and gas prices rise and as access to the raw material exports needed for the production of fertilizers plummets. How much though does this language of crisis as particular, contextual, uh, temporally bound, suffice to describe the conditions of the present. Uh, in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has also been clear that the virus's spread has exposed fault lines that run further and deeper than the circumstances of the pandemic itself. Highlighting the nature of a global food system uh, that both relies on and reproduces acute inequalities of risk, vulnerability, hunger, wealth, and power. To this end, the pandemic revealed the global food system as not simply in a state of particular and acute disruption, but rather as itself inherently disruptive of human lives and flourishing of relationships between people, places, and ecologies. So the collective project of which the speakers here today have all been a part has sought to take the upheaval of the pandemic as a springboard from which to interrogate a larger set of structural, economic, environmental and political fault lines running through the global food system. In a context in which disruptions to the production, distribution and consumption of food are figured as exceptions to the smooth, just-in-time efficiencies of global supply chains, our speakers here today and the essays that we gather in this book examine the pandemic not simply as a particular and acute moment of disruption, but rather as a lens on a deeper, longer set of structural processes within which disruption is endemic. So we have sought to heed those who have cautioned of the immobilizing and obfuscatory framings of crisis as exception. The vulnerabilities and inequities produced as part of business as usual in the global food system have been intensified and rendered newly visible. But this intensification through COVID has also shown new light on transformational possibilities. So extending beyond the bounded linearities of supply chain models, there is a complex constellation of forces that traverse and govern food systems. From the transnational workings of the UN, the World Trade Organization and European Union committees, to the accelerating influence of transnational agri-investors, uh, the industrialization of production and processes to intensify and expand the scale of farming to the fragility of migrant labour markets uh, exposed by prolonged international border closures, and also the determined pushback of small scale regenerative farming, food sovereignty and cooperative movements. So to grasp the food system in its complexity forces us to confront fundamental questions, including, for example, whether the farm is the logical place to start any inquiry in relation to food. Or in other words, to ask where do global supply chains begin and where do they end? Indeed, do they end? In asking such questions, this collection and this collective project seeks to speak with and build upon the critical scholarship of people like Anna Singh on supply chain capitalism and others who have similarly drawn attention to the cultural and political logics within which supply chains and capitalist value are necessarily embedded. However, we also seek to extend beyond the supply chain frame in its critical as well as its traditional modes, to the sprawling constellations of power, materiality, and entangled life 
but necessarily exceed it. And in this vein, it was uh, so stimulating to hear yesterday from keynote lecturer, Professor Nora McKeon, and her reminder of the multitude of locally embedded food provisioning systems, systems which feed so much of the world's population, which exist outside of the global food supply chain. And her urging to look beyond that dominant system is one very much in step with the project that we have undertaken here. So at a time when food is more likely to be grasped in terms of speculative investment than as a common good, we propose it in this project as a vital prism for grappling with the logics by which power circulates in the world. Attention to food, along the supply chain and beyond its edges sheds light on the complex workings and failures of colonial capitalism, on escalating climate change, on the reproduction of hunger and structural exclusion, but also on alternative regimes of value that can anchor food and feeding firmly back on the ground. So we're going to hear from some of the contributors to this project today, and I'm going to hand over uh, to Melinda Hinkson, who is the co-editor of this project and connecting virtually with us today, as are the other presenters, uh, will speak, as I mentioned, for about five minutes apiece, and then we'll open up to discussion. Uh, so Melinda, over to you. Hi, thanks, Tori. Hello, everyone. So our first or our next speaker, in fact, having just heard from Tori, is Lauren Rickards who um, is joining us also from Melbourne, where, where I am as well. And Lauren's going to speak to the, the essay that she co-authored with me called Supply Chains as Disruption. Thanks very much, Lauren. Great, thank you, Melinda, and hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, the chapter that I'm uh, speaking to stems from work uh, with Melinda uh, as part of something called the Future of Food Project that we've been doing through the Institute of Postcolonial Studies with the support of the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation and the broader support Ooh. of a great uh, collection of um, collaborators and, and, um, and friends uh, up in the Northwest Victoria around Mildura. And I know we've got, um, Jason Modica online as well, um, and others who have been very supportive with this work. So in traveling up uh, in this part of the world, a very much one of um, Australia's sort of key export zones when it comes to wheat, uh, Melinda and I were taken uh, to reflecting on things such as these global supply chains that many of the paddocks around us as we traveled around there uh, were oriented towards. And one of the things that um, quickly strikes you about that um, part of the world is the great extent of some of these uh, wheat fields and other uh, commodities uh, in the horticultural zone as well. And at the time we were up there, it was during uh, COVID, which of course has been part of the stimulus for this chapter. And one of the sort of hidden disruptions that we were uh, aware of and became aware of in speaking to farmers and others was a disruption in the production of Chinese uh, glyphosate, um, all caused by a range of different upstream uh, production um, disruptions in raw materials, such as glycine, labour shortages, transport blockages, et cetera. And what this meant for Australian farmers in the sort of relatively remote sort of corner of the world where we were, was that their major uh, pesticide uh, use, which needed to be part of their uh, preparation um, of the fields for their um, uh, wheat production was actually badly, badly disrupted. And so what we had here was a really sort of in, uh, visibilization of a very long, very important, but largely invisible supply chain. Now, because it was caused by the pandemic, it seemed to be like one of those classics, the black swan events, you know, something that uh, you know, it was completely unpredictable, uh, largely um, uh, exceptional. But as you work up there and as you start to uh, dig further into Australian agriculture in general, and I dare say in other parts of the world, you start to see that in actual fact, these sorts of disruptions, these sorts of um, ruptures, if you like, are actually part and parcel of being part of, being enrolled in these global supply chains. And so while we have this sort of sense of um, disasters and uh, all these sorts of um, abnormalities uh, emerging, 
What we uh, wanted to really bring out with our chapter was the normalness of these sorts of disruptions and the actual um, uncertainties that are part and parcel of being part of these global supply chains. We did this by drawing on the work of Anna Singh and, we, um, and other theorists. We wanted to draw out three particular characteristics of the global supply chains to start to bring this um, uncertainty and volatility to the surface. So the first was simply looking at this idea of scaling, which is at the heart of global supply chains. And as Anna Singh puts it, scalability is the ability to expand and expand and expand without rethinking basic elements. So it's this idea of a sort of house of mirrors, if you like, that allows us to see only uniform blocks, always ready for further expansion. Now that is also characterized by sharply, uh, sharp differentiations and divisions because only very select parts of the world are lucky enough, if you like, to be selected, to be enclosed into the chains of connectivity that make up global supply chains. And it's these very, very precise flows of connectivity that actually make up these supply chains. And it's this triumph um, of precision that uh, weaves together those con constant flows that mean that agri-food uh, um, supply chains actually function. What we have here is a kind of idea of being um, of competition that draws people to want to be part of these enclosed lines of connectivity. And it's something that's colonized minds as well as spaces in Australia. This is the idea of wanting to be part of these export markets, of wanting to take innovation to scale, of always wanting and striving to be bigger and bigger. And farmers are very much targeted with this sort of language, this idea of becoming adopters of a certain sort of technology, which itself is being scaled in order that they themselves may scale in order that they may become part of these longer and longer, larger and larger supply chains. That brings us to the second characteristic of the global supply chains we drew out, which is this idea of differentiating, which is about relative difference, those who are in and those who are out. And one of the things that um, really drives um, a lot of the anxiety which underpins uh, global supply chains is whether or not you can maintain your position within them once you get in there. And so there's always that sense that if you prove yourself to be unreliable, if you prove yourself to actually uh, not to be able to cope with these normal disruptions that characterize supply chains, that you will be replaced because you are replaceable. Supply chains are con constantly able to look around and find others to take your place. And that's that sense of the sort of um, commensurability of farms, commensurability of commodities. And it's a much greater uh, idea, much larger idea than the notion of commodification normally picks up on. It's really about a disciplining. It's about disciplining suppliers and workers and logistics and of course, natures, so that those who resist or fail to perform are quickly replaced. That brings us to the third characteristic we looked at, which is revaluing. And this is where we look beyond the physical characteristics and the actual successes or failures of those involved to seeing what they look like through the lens of finance. Now, financialization also um, is a massive a driver of scaling. It's also a massive driver of that standard, standardization and homogenization. And, you know, as it's um, very clear to anyone who looks at Australian agriculture, we're talking not just about commodification, we're talking about financialization. And what that means is that the actual financial value of things is determined by a whole host of considerations above and beyond their material, physical, or technical characteristics. Adding to that is the role of infrastructure here and that uh, the interplay between infrastructure and um, financialization is one of the kind of basic foundations of setting up the actual spatial footprints of our global supply chains. So all of this means that from an average farmer's perspective, working within these supply chains is both highly desirable. In fact, it sort of seems almost like um, the only option in some ways, but also increasingly uncertain. It's absolutely impossible to try to anticipate, for example, the prices of things and how they jump around. And 
then that makes them in turn vulnerable to a whole range of ideas and um, initiatives that try to, if you like, prey upon that uncertainty by rolling out a whole range of technologically based, financially based tools to help them manage that uncertainty. So we see a sort of feeding of this uncertainty, a feeding of this idea of rolling out and scaling, layers upon layers of scaling are going on here. And that plays out in the way um, uh, real estate and uh, land prices are being tackled uh, in the agricultural sector as we talk about. So all up, what that means is that um, global supply chains are naturally or uh, inherently disrupted. They're uh, infused with these three characteristics of scaling, differentiating and revaluing. And what that means is that at the level um, of country, of the level of social relationships, they are very, very much drivers of rupture. And this rupture is something that I think those involved in these supply chains, the farmers we spoke to, are deeply, deeply aware of and increasingly concerned about. This is stuff about looking out at what's going on around you, such as the almond plantations that are being rolled out um, at, the, uh, at the behest of a whole range of government and private sector organisations across the Murray-Darling Basin, looking out at that and feeling not just the awe at the scale of it, but also increasingly anger and increasingly despair. So our conclusion is that supply chains are made up of prosperity, but also precarity, and this is built into them. And that this means that the idea of rupture really captures at the heart what these global supply chains are achieving. They're rupturing us at the level of community. They're rupturing us at the level of um, country. And we finish by um, on the slightly hopeful note that there are groups coming together. There are new sorts of alliances emerging that are seeking to tackle this, tackle this head on and actually learn uh, looking at our earlier layers of colonisation, of course, working with First Nations people in Australia to actually rethink these layers and layers um, of rupturing that are going on to try to find a better way. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lauren. So our next speaker is Sarah Sippel, who's joining us from Leipzig. And Sarah is going to speak to her chapter Agri-Investment Cashing In on COVID-19. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for joining us from what must be a pretty ungodly hour. Over to you. Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello to Australia. Um, very nice to see some familiar faces. And hello to all the other places where people are joining from as well. Yeah, it's, it's quite early here in the morning or deep at night, one could say, but uh, I'm still happy to be here. So yeah, I'm um, looking at uh, agri-food investment um, in my chapter and I'm asking this question, cashing in on COVID-19 by juxtaposing um, two moments of crisis, uh, the 2008 uh, food price crisis and the more recent COVID-19 crisis in, in this chapter. So as we all know, global agri-food relationships are continuously changing. However, there are some periods uh, in time that are perceived as critical moments when sudden events challenge these established patterns within the agri-food system. Many observers have identified the food price hikes in 2008 as such a turning point. Back in 2008, after two decades of volatile but overall declining food prices, global food prices for staple foods increased significantly within just a few years. The food price hikes especially impacted on those groups of people who already needed to spend a major part of their income on food. At the same time, the increase in food commodity prices also led a number of new actors starting to engage much more actively in the area of natural resources. And among these were uh, state and finance backed actors who were first and foremost prompted to invest in productive farmland. Now, a decade later, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted global agri-food relationships again. Given that financial actors, much more intimate engagement with agriculture emerged out of this conjunction um, of crises back in 2008, I'm asking in this chapter, how have these um, financial actors now dealt with the COVID-19 crisis? And I'm showing um, 
how the pandemic has been rhetorically framed, what kinds of investment strategies have been promoted, and how financial actors um, are anticipating their engagement with agri-food in post-pandemic times. Overall, I conclude that while COVID-19 has once again revealed the multiple flaws in our food system, for some such crises uh, also provide the opportunity for profit making. Agri-food investors have used the most recent crisis to further strengthen the justification for agricultural investment. While in 2008 event, the, the 2008 events represented the initial crisis moment that incentivized investors to search for alternative investment possibilities, the pandemic has now been presented as consolidating agriculture as an alternative investment class. And I want to end or conclude here with three observations that I make in this regard um, in the chapter. First, I conclude that throughout the both crises, the rhetoric has followed a rather simplistic neo-Malthusian argument that people need to eat no matter what in moments of crisis, as much as during a pandemic. This narrative continuously disregards, however, the complexity of food security and the critical insight that food security is not just a matter of food being produced. The pandemic has lowered people's ability to access sufficient and nutritious food due to the consequences of lockdowns and economic recession, especially again for vulnerable groups as um, it also happened in 2008. Thus financial investments that focus on food production and supply chains might allow investors to generate returns from this now um, considered essential sector, but they do not help alleviate the food insecurity of those who cannot access food. Secondly, then, um, I observe that the pandemic has been used to justify and defend further investments in agriculture and food that go beyond those uh, promoted in 2008. Most prominently, um, these are investments in the areas of ag and food tech. New digital agri-food technologies, such as um, increased automization or robotics um, used on farms, have been presented as both a fix for social issues, as well as being undercapitalized and therefore newly emerging lucrative investment opportunities. However, underlying issues of social inequalities and vulnerabilities of mostly migrant farm workers and food processing workers are not being tackled within this approach. So rather than suggesting that farm and factory workers labor conditions need to change, um, the human factor has been identified as a problem here to technologically deal with and to discard. Thirdly, and lastly, the pandemic has made sustainability and climate change much more important and prominent uh, themes within the agri-food investment discourse, both, both of which were not part of the original agri-food investor discourse in, uh, following 2008. However, what we can observe or what I observe is that these issues are being addressed purely within a market rationale. While environmental issues are not now at least recognized, which is, I guess, a good thing to some extent as important challenges, um, the agri-food investor discourse suggests that they are not dealt with out of insight or necessity, but only if there are worthwhile financial returns stemming from engaging with these topics. In some then, while the agri-food investment discourse was, has moved on to new areas and issues due to the pandemic, its underlying logic, I argue, has remained quite stable. Amid calls for more of the same approaches to solve those crises it has helped to produce in the first place. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks so much, Sarah. Our next presenter is Kelly Donati, also here in Melbourne, and she is going to speak to her chapter, Going Against the Grain in the West Australian Wheat Belt. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you, uh, uh, Melinda and to Tori as well for inviting me to be part of this panel and, and for the work that you've put into putting this incredible collection of contributions together. Um, my chapter in the book focuses on uh, Di and Ian Haggerty. Uh, the Haggertys are a regenerative farming couple in the Western Australian wheat belt, uh, which is a landscape whose disruption of life worlds is so stark that it's um, visible from space. And this scarred landscape only hints at a much deeper trauma that's rooted in uh, dispossession wrought by settler colonial agriculture. 
The wheat belt today, of course, continues to be dominated by techno-scientific imaginaries that mobilize farmers, ecologies, and knowledge systems in, in service of the extractive logic of supply chain capitalism. Um, my chapter explores what uh, transformational possibilities might emerge in this um, brutalized landscape. Um, but before I go into the detail of the chapter, I just want to kind of briefly reflect on my approach to agriculture. Um, as uh, Christopher Mays and Angie Sassano point out in their chapter on consumer um, against consumer ethics towards the um, to the end of the book, um, alternative food movements uh, tend to entrench the sovereignty of the consumer as the agent of political transformation. And this rhetoric of paddock to plate and the kind of very linear logic that it represents is um, very ensconced in contemporary gastronomic imaginaries about what it means to eat and live well. So as an ethnographer of gastronomy, I'm kind of curiously uninterested in how or what people eat, but I'm more interested in how production and consumption are uh, mutually constituted and co-located. So rather than taking the farm as a site of production uh, at one end of the supply chain and the marketplace or as a site of consumption at the other end with um, you know, farmers and consumers in need of reconnection, um, I see agricultural landscapes as kind of webs of appetite that are given shape by a particular logic of food that's imposed on them or what um, Alex Blanchett and, and, and Lauren and Melinda describe in their chapters as visions of nourishment. So I approach production or farming not as a practice that feeds humans, but that must also feed many others, um, animals, plants, fungi and microbes. So Production is therefore always a, a collection of consumptive practices. So I'm particularly interested in farmers who are attentive to these appetites of others and to what it takes for other creatures to eat and live well or to cultivate the, the conditions for mutual co-flourishing, if you like. And, I, like. and I kind of put this under the umbrella of um, what I call multi-species gastronomy. So I don't frame the Haggerty's farming practice like this in the book, but this is my sort of thinking behind um, agriculture. And it's also where I kind of find, I suppose, glimmers of, of hope for a better future. Um, but where the Haggerty's, I think, differ from um, uh, the broader um, regenerative farming community is in their very unconventional epistemic practices for um, acknowledging and responding to the living collectives on their farms as kind of knowing agents. So even though their cash crops, um, grain and fodder uh, and wool are feeding into quite undifferentiated global supply chains, um, their farming practices actively decenter and uh, decenter techno-scientific temporalities and cultivate um, webs of multi-species care across landscape functions and scale. So they really um, are kind of interested in attuning themselves to dynamic ecology circulating between the microbiomes of humans, of sheep, of soil, and even the atmosphere in ways that exist within but also um, exceed the circuits of capitalism. So um, these epistemic practices were profoundly in, in influenced by their um, by the years they spent in, in remote um, communities in the Kimberley, and they don't make claims to be holders or practitioners of Aboriginal knowledge, but their encounters with elders was what provoked the realization that other ways of knowing are possible, and and even that the land itself is a knowing agent. So, for them, this fundamentally destabilized the sort of hegemonic authority of the techno-scientific expertise that they relied on in the early days of their farming practice. And so um, these practices for me kind of suggest the possibilities, I suppose, of, of epistemic pluralism in enacting alternative temporalities and practices of care, even within uh, the global supply chains of a post-pandemic world. So I don't, um, I don't propose, um, you know, any answers to what a post-COVID food system should look like, and I don't propose regenerative agriculture as a silver bullet solution, particularly when global corporations such as Nestle are so um, masterful at co-opting the discourse practices and markets of regenerative agriculture. Um, and it's also the case that any attempt to do farming differently, whether it's regenerative or otherwise, will only ever be partial in its potential to extract itself from the logic of the market. Um, even indigenous food system advocates and practitioners are finding themselves having to use the rhetoric of the market in order to access the resources and support systems needed to heal country and community. But as Alexis Shutwell reminds us, the pursuit of ethical purity is ultimately a political dead end. So sometimes we have to proceed in imperfect and in pure worlds. So um, I ground my kind of hopes, I guess, for the post-pandemic food system in the possibilities of um, epistemic pluralism that might emerge from alliances between indigenous communities and settler farmers working towards uh, fuller visions of nourishment, to borrow again from Lauren and Melinda and in nurturing food systems that are designed to feed um, more than humans. Um, so I think if the pandemic has revealed the weaknesses of the global food system, it's 
deepening cracks are um, where these seeds for more diverse ways of knowing and for distributing um, power more equitably within uh, the food system might take uh, take root and flourish. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kelly. Our, our next presentation is a video presentation from Tommaso Ferrando, who's currently asleep somewhere in Italy. Um, so we'll just take a little moment for Cairns to get that video ready to go. Tommaso's presentation um, is connected to his very interesting and important chapter in the book on the UN Food System Summit, Disaster Capitalism and the Future of Food. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, greetings from, uh, from Italy, from summer, very hot summer. Um, sorry for not being there with you. It would have been, uh, would have been amazing. The, the program sounds fascinating and uh, the intellectual exchanges that we had in the past and that are appearing in the, in the book are, are really thrilling. And I'm, I'm sorry that I couldn't make it and I'm sorry that I <laughs> didn't feel like waking up in the middle of the night, but my contribution would have been uh, almost uh, uh, inexistent at the time of the, of the morning. So thanks, thanks, Tori, thanks, Melinda, for, for setting this uh, panel up, and thanks a lot for the opportunity also to, to contribute um, to the edited volume. I, I just went through the, the, the digital version, and uh, I couldn't stop reading all the amazing uh, chapters that my, my colleagues have been, have been drafting. It's, um, it's extremely important, and extremely important, I think, uh, right now to, to have a, a book that is called Beyond uh, Global Food uh, Supply Chains. I think that the beyond and the global are, are key elements, and also central to the kind of work that I've been uh, trying to do that I've been putting in my, in my chapter. Um, so what is my chapter about? Well, I think it's uh, unfortunately pretty, pretty timely as an intervention. Um, it's a chapter that uh, talks uh, about or uses the, the notion, the Naomi Klein's notion of, of disaster capitalism to talk about what is happening at the level of the global governance of, uh, of supply chains and, and food systems in, in general. And when I drafted it, we were thinking about the issue of crisis and the use of crisis and, and the way in which the notion of, of the COVID pandemic was leveraged uh, in order to present a certain future for global food supply chains. And unfortunately, a few months down the road and, 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 and while the book was going uh, to press, uh, there is a new crisis or so-called crisis uh, that, is, um, that is utilized, that is uh, leveraged uh, both in terms of media but also in terms of uh, policymakers and in terms of private actors to push for a specific vision of the, of the future of food. So the argument uh, in, the, in the chapter is that the COVID-19, rather than uh, being used in order to uh, radically and, and structurally rethink the global food chains uh, that brought us here in terms of food insecurity, in terms of visiting, in terms of depletion uh, of soil and, and, uh, and nature and ecological relationship that had been uh, increasingly deforesting and so on and so forth, instead of being um, opening up a window of opportunity, sort of the, uh, a portal towards a, a different future have been utilized to, to consolidate and strengthening the same kind of patterns and, and solutions that uh, the private and public actors that brought us here um, have been uh, proposing for, for decades. Um, and this is particularly worrisome because we know that uh, although like the crisis like COVID and, uh, and the war in Ukraine or the invasion of Ukraine um, may be contingent and may be somehow uh, solved, hopefully uh, within the span of a certain amount of, of time with certain measures, there are underlying situations like the, the climate emergency uh, that will be with us uh, for the future and, and definitely unknown. Uh, the lack of a change in patterns and the lack of change of, uh, of trajectory of the food system um, would just intensify the problems that we are uh, witnessing. So the idea of the paper was to say that we need to change. There is a, a, a evidence uh, at all levels that the, the global food system has to go beyond what it is today and also has to go beyond the idea of, of the global and to regionalize, to bring back, to create uh, uh, sufficiency, autonomy and, and put that centers dignity of people, ecological relationships, uh, human rights, and so on and so forth. But what we saw during the COVID pandemic was exactly the opposite. And, and the evidence was, in my opinion, what happened with the United Nations Food System Summit that was uh, called by the UN uh, Secretary General before the COVID pandemic, but then really uh, used the COVID pandemic as, a, as an opportunity to create a space uh, for private actors to present themselves 
as those who are going to be uh, saving the world and those who are saving the, the food system and those who are uh, capable of implementing the solutions that are needed for the ecological and, and social problems of the food system. So in the chapter, I enter more into the details, but the idea is that uh, this new space has been created and this rhetoric and narrative of multi-stakeholderism has been pushed forward as the solution for the current crisis or the multiple crisis of the, of the food system, but it is exactly multi-stakeholderism and is exactly this idea of bringing everyone around the table that is denying the issues of power, in, power imbalance, that is denying issue of unequal distribution of resources, unequal distribution of food uh, that are at the core of the crisis that we are uh, witnessing. So my invitation is in the chapter is that of uh, taking the food system summit as a starting point of analysis of how certain players are uh, riding the wave of crisis in order to entrench their position rather than um, you know, being uh, scrutinized and being uh, challenged in their, in their operation. And that is, is very visible even more now when actors like Larry Fink from, from BlackRock is saying that more is to be done with, with food as if financial investors were not part of, uh, of the problem rather than part of the, of the solution. And if the Food System Summit uh, is important, uh, I think even more important would be COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, where it's my uh, expectation that the climate and the food agendas will converge. And COP27 will probably be the moment of crystallization of one specific vision of the future of food that as much as the COP26 has been would be a vision based on private interest, on uh, carbon neutrality, uh, on net zero, on, on, on large scale um, technological investments that really marginalize uh, indigenous people, marginalize peasants, they marginalize agriculture, they marginalize alternative visions of the food system and just take for granted the global nature of food and take for granted the, the commodity nature of food that I think um, are two of the, of the main root causes of the crisis that we are experiencing. I already spoke for too long, sorry for that. Uh, enjoy the rest of the, of the conference and the meeting. I really look forward to continuing the conversation also in person or digitally with everyone. And thanks to Tommaso. Uh, our final speaker is Alex Blanchett, who is joining us from Massachusetts. Um, thanks very much, Alex. You're going to speak to your afterward theme of temporary measures. Thanks, Melinda, and thanks, Tori. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Okay. So what I appreciate most about this volume is ultimately how the authors end up burying, burrowing into a key contradiction. So that is, the authors depict a world of food commodities beset by ubiquitous disruption, even as the fundamental conditions of agri-food capitalism end up changing very little over time. So there, in some examples in, in, in the book are moments of rupture that might unsettle capitalist hegemony, paradoxically entrench it deeper. Declarations of emergency become development tools to ensure food chains attract yet more capital. Invocations of crisis seek further investment in the status quo. The disruptions of su supply chains amidst the pandemic were not exceptional so much as they clarified the norms of a system of food provisioning operating in a state of permanent emergency. So inspired especially by Stedin Petro's excellent chapter, my suggestion is to consider the capitalist food system as one that develops through temporary measures. A temporary measure is an act that seeks to patch a structural weakness before it explodes in a way that could destabilize the system itself. Temporary measures are quite simply iterative makeshift solutions to endemic problems. What I find useful about focusing into temporary measures is that it might open up alternative ways of thinking about political agency in times of mundane crisis. Seeing the food system as a patchwork of temporary measures helps us not only sense their contingent messiness, it allows us to question the idea that capitalist sustenance is directed by omniscient agents. Appearing less like all powerful planners, in these chapters, corporate financiers and international policymakers emerge as almost reactive, desperately trying to keep afloat capitalist food worlds. Now, I personally approach COVID's non-transformational upheavals 
through my own experiences working in United States animal agribusinesses. A decade prior to this pandemic, I spent eight months shadowing senior managers across their activities in one of the world's largest pork corporations, a network that annually births, raises, and kills some 7 million hogs for global distribution. When I was doing this field work, I expected to find a group of people firmly in control of their operations. These places had existed for 15 to 20 years at that point. But these managers' days instead consisted of devising ways to tamp down crises. Their near every moment of work was directed towards patching problems of animal disease, ecological pollution, or biological unpredictability that stemmed from their own ambitions to confine millions of immunocompromised and homogenous animals in a small circle of land. At a moment when agri-food corporations project themselves as smoothly stitching up the entire planet through supply chains, it is worth taking seriously the fragility of how food firms maintain a hold on life. Now, the five largest North American meat production firms alone sickened 59,000 of their employees, and they have killed no fewer than 269 people since March 2020. By invoking the Defense Production Act in the US, itself the ultimate temporary measure, in April 2020, in part to insulate these companies from legal prosecution, Donald Trump declared these workers sacrifices to infrastructure. And the perversity of this temporary measure is that it made all of the harmful temporary measures prior to the DPA, the Defense Production Act, appear innocent in comparison to the stunning state-sanctioned license to industrially kill workers. Consider that prior to the emergence of COVID-19, United States animal agribusiness was a legal patchwork of slaughterhouse line speed limit exceptions put into place to accommodate growing animal herd sizes that allowed companies to strain human bodies to the point where debilitating repetitive motion injuries were routine. Or moreover, as American confined animal feeding operations have grown in scale and concentration since the 1980s, they have been permitted to operate through special laws that exempt them from regulation under normal industrial rules governing air pollution and emission standards. Even animal breeding farms, as Gabriel Rosenberg has shown, with their erotic methods of artificial insemination that help increase productivity, had to retroactively pursue special legal exceptions from state legislatures to keep them from running afoul of bestiality laws. North American meat production has long developed by exceeding moral and legal norms and then pursuing temporary measures that enable it to continue. COVID-19 and the invocation of the DPA was just the ultimate one. The point I'm trying to make today is simple. Without these temporary measures, this system will collapse. Now this roundtable's organizers asked us to state what we think a post-pandemic food system could or should look like. And what COVID-19 made clear, at least in the United States, is that relatively few think this system of capitalist flesh generation is a good thing, but yet even fewer can fathom its collapse and the very real effects on workers' livelihoods, rural communities, and the character of urban diets. It isn't a word too big to fail. What I am starting to think about now, and frankly hope for, is a movement that can make it socially possible to welcome the wholesale and unapologetic abolition of things like industrial meat. It is important to champion alternatives. They make other worlds imaginable and possible. But I also want us to begin dwelling more with what the disruptive end of dominant forms would look like. But what I think we need now, and what COVID-19, at least in the US, has perhaps showed us we lack, is a sense of what it would take from political organization to safety nets to welcome the collapse of things like industrial meat. So what I hope for in a future food system is one where things actually can be disrupted and where they can actually fail. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alex. What a terrific and very nicely hopeful uh, point to, to round out that series of uh, very uh, knotty conundrums that have been presented to us across um, the those papers. So thanks very much to all of our speakers. 
We've got a good half an hour and a bit for some discussion now. We also have some other contributors to the book um, with us. So I, I would invite anybody to um, raise your hand, ra raise an issue, um, either of, of uh, question or um, provocation to any or all of our panels, um, any, any of our um, panelists. Um, and, and perhaps while you're all gathering your thoughts, I've just got a couple of, of, of questions that I might pose that, that will bring us to, to this discussion from a couple of different angles. And the first, I guess, is really um, just to draw out a little bit more a sense of um, the, the, the picture that, we, that, that, that this book is painting and working with. So we have these ideas of disaster capitalism, of globalization and crisis, these are very widely used terms, but we also know that from the vantage of key players, the conditions that are being described in these chapters are ripe with opportunities. And the, the first um, and most dominant way in which they're ripe for opportunities are for those who are making very, very substantial profits out of um, large scale ag. So um, Alex, given um, we, we've ended with you, I, I wouldn't mind drawing you out a little bit and also inviting Sarah, if, if, if your brain is functioning at this time of the night and you feel like you can say a little bit more, that the two of you work in very, very interesting places in relation to um, being able to give us understandings of how industrial capitalism on the one hand and financialization on the other, um, organize the food system, the global, global food system in its, in its present formation. So I wonder if either or both of you um, could just sort of share with us in broad brushstroke, what you see as the, the really key factors that, that we need to be taking into account in order to understand what is wrong with the global food system in the present. Don't be shy. Um, Alex, you, yeah, Alex, you're welcome to go ahead since you've you've just spoken and seem to be very, um, yeah, into it. But I, I love this idea of um, welcoming the collapse and and what would it take um, to to welcome this kind of collapse and embrace whatever uh, kind of situation we might we might face afterwards. But um, yeah, in regard in regards to your question, um, Linda, I just. I've just uh, been working on, on a different chapter, still um, engaging with some of my data that I collected in Australia on the financialization of farming. And um, in this chapter, or in this paper, I'm specifically also engaging with the question of data and uh, digital technologies and how they are used also to, to maintain and, and continuously reinforce these mechanisms um, that we've, I think, heard so much now uh, in this session. And um, so from that perspective, um, just to your question, I think this the system is very much, um, at least in from my research, it's very much governed by certain ideologies that, that are not new, um, that are not very surprising, but that are basically yeah, looking at numbers, looking at data, and increasingly in the context of big data are also now trying to, to create um, food systems that well, that don't have these these issues anymore. These um, what Alex talked about, and in, in the other chapter as well. These these, these temporary temporary engagements with um, near collapses or uh, multiple crises that that have to be dealt with every single day. So, um, from my understanding, there this idea is to really try and create um, a system where. Um, that is totally controllable, that is where agriculture becomes predictable and um, can be projected into the future with very um, clear scenarios of how it's going to work, how much returns you're going to make, how much profit you can you can have there and, and taking out risk, which, which of course is um, what the financial sector is dealing with. And so this, yeah, I would I would consider this as one perspective, at least from my research, um, this kind of datification, numerification, and increasing 
representation of, of agriculture as something that yeah only exists in numbers. And just maybe on um, very last point on, on this uh, last note regarding um, maybe where hope could come from. And um, one idea I've, I've had in, in looking at, at this process of increasingly trying to yeah, assetize farms and turn them into these benchmark assets um, and with the use of data and uh, digital technologies was that in a way, if, if this is not being done and certain technologies or measures and things are not being put in place in order to make agriculture and farming calculable in that kind of sense, this can also serve a bit as a protective mechanism. So um, if people would refuse or if there was some sort of, I don't know, activism to not produce data, say, or to not uh, contribute to this new verification, it also, to some extent, I would say, protects because then um, these kinds of calculations cannot take place and financial investors, at least from my understanding, would not engage um, in these kinds of acti activities because they can just not calculate what is going on. And so that could be maybe a protection uh, in the future. So I'll, I'll end it with this and hope that some of these thoughts, given this time of the day or of the night, I'm, I'm joining you all from um, somehow makes sense. Um, thank you. It definitely does. And I'll just, I'll just pick, I'll be very brief and just, just pick up from Sarah's statement on the industrial side when, when Sarah said, you know, there's nothing new here, right? In, in many ways, this is not new. It's predictable. And um, I think that's kind of the thing I find most striking about industrial agribusiness, especially animal agribusiness in the US is just how old this is, right? This is really like logics dating to the Chicago meat packers of the 1890s. But and, and there's nothing new here, but what I am compounded, or what I am concerned about, what kind of haunted about is just the degree of compounded growth we're seeing. Um, you know, in, in, in my book, I talk a little bit about how um, the company I studied had 1,100 product codes that it could potentially put onto any given pig, right? 1,100 different commodities coming from each animal. And I thought that was just a really haunting image of the state of industrial capitalism and how it continues to evolve in farming systems if it's not checked in some ways, so that it just keeps piling and piling and piling value in value forms into this pig species. And um, I guess, you know, I sort of started closing my, my brief talk today about mentioning alternatives and, and alongside Kelly being a little bit concerned about um, the, the co-optability of alternatives. And, you know, I've just been thinking a lot about with the discussions of cellular agriculture, discussions of regenerative animal agriculture, of what it means for these um, forms to keep emerging in a context where industrial animal agribusiness still exists, right? Where instead it's just like, oh yes, there's yet another way to commodify pigs, or there's yet another way to render profit out of animal flesh. And um, I don't know, in the way, during the, the pandemic, I was giving talks and, um, you know, a lot of people were kind of pushing me and saying, you know, what, well, what's to be done here? Um, what's your positive vision? And my vision in the midst of the outbreaks in the, in, in, in the plants was simply that they need to be shut down. And I was struck by how unsatisfactory that was to audiences who are constantly, okay, okay but what's the positive alternative or what's the positive um, alternative vision? And, um, and I don't know, I think there's, I, I think there's a symptom and a problem there. And, um, you know, I, I think I want to work and I think we perhaps all need to work to create more hope or more positive visions from the very possibility of some things just simply ending um, as ends in, in and of themselves, precisely because, you know, from my perspective, we're in this context where you just see value forms piling up and piling up and piling up in these animals. And I think a really important, like, political strategy goal and so forth is to simply stop them or to simply limit or decrease the sheer quantity of demands on crops, animals, and landscapes, and ultimately people. Thanks very much to both of you. And I'm just going to ask one more question now to, to Lauren and Kelly, which, which, which brings us to the, 
the other vantage, I guess, that, that, that we have in these papers, that the ground truthing vantage, if you like, which is about what kind of capacity or, or, or scope is there for farmers themselves to creatively make decisions that, that involve stepping to the side of the global food supply chain. I mean, Kelly, obviously your, your chapter is a, is a case study in uh, a, very, a very unusual and remarkable case study in a, in a couple who seem to be able to both make the most of global capital, but to do that in order to bring about an, an, another philosophical and ecological approach to growing. Um, but, but, but just in general, what kinds of transformations are you both seeing um, on the ground in, in farming practice that perhaps go against the grain of this, this potentially all encompassing picture that, that we're getting? Well, I'll jump in if you like. Thanks, Melinda. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a huge diversity um, of such responses and I think they are both at the level of stepping outside of those actual existing global supply chains. So it might be something as basic as seeking out different um, sources of synthetic pesticides. So moving away from one kind of long distance uh, global supply chain, perhaps to more local production, et cetera. So, you know, that we call that a sort of incremental shift, but it's, it's rejecting one aspect of that global supply chain, which might be its location in another country. It might be its location at a great distance. And then, so if that's a sort of one end of the spectrum of shifting, and we see quite a lot of that too, with regards to sort of seeking different markets and diversifying markets, at the other end of the spectrum, I think we're seeing also um, increasingly a rethinking, um, sometimes a rejection, but also creative reworking of some of those um, underlying concepts that you and I explored, you know, questioning this idea of scale, of the uniformity of um, land, uniformity of commodities, and going for more of those differentiations which might lead one to kind of, you know, I don't know, launch into the more the niche market. So it's not that the, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that the responses aren't always capital A alternative. Some of them are, but some of them you can see people working within, you know, their resources and their worlds to kind of still try to rework and renegotiate these things. If we look at that idea of financialization and the way that's shifting um, a whole lot of valuations and locking in some notions of scale, particularly because it brings, for example, that competition with large international corporate entities, such as the ones behind the almond plantation rollout. Then, you know, there's different credit providers, there's different ways of working around some of those limitations. And, you know, as you and I have looked at, some of those might look like cooperatives. So banding together with other farmers across your industry or in your area to actually so, somehow interact with the market in a slightly different form. So to, in some, I think there's some kind of, you know, there are some really radical rejections and alternatives. And I think, you know, Kelly's example is a beautiful one of how that is such a multifaceted change for people. It changes, you know, their goals, it changes their relationships, it changes their ways of farming. At the same time, there's a huge raft of things that are more um, partial, but I still think quite hopeful. Yeah, I guess uh, following on from from Lauren, I um, I guess I see a lot of similar sorts of things um, in in the producers that I speak to. Most of them are really small scale. Um, and part of the reason that I was interested in the, the Haggerty's was to see, you know, can you have this kind of relational approach to agriculture at a much larger scale? And so, um, so the Haggerty's for me were a, a kind of hopeful example of that. And for them, you know, the interesting thing is that they kind of, you know, going to that question of data, um, if you're if you're a regenerative farmer and you're trying to step out of a, a global supply chain, it's, it's actually difficult if you're a wheat farmer because those supply chains are so kind of fixed. Um, and they would like to step out of them actually, but 
um, they need capital to do that. And to, to, to get the capital, you have to deal with, you know, banks um, and bank managers who who um, who have very um, particular ideas of what a farm should look like and what the goals of a farm should be. And and if you want to convince a bank manager to um, to give you money to to create new supply chains, if you like, then you have to give them the kind of data that um, probably Sarah is 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 talking about. Um, and, and perhaps withholding because they're constantly having to, regenerative farmers are constantly having to kind of prove that um, regenerative farming can be as profitable as conventional farming. So, so there's this, um, I guess, uh, butting heads with these kinds of um, uh, really entrenched systems, but um, also, you know, in kind of um, thinking about scale, there's, I, I really see a kind of growing attentiveness to, um, you know, my, microbial scales like very very sort of small scale stuff around um you know the atmospheric microbiome or the soil microbiome and a diversification of um not product but of life um so thinking about how can life be diversified on the farm how can um you know how can we um expand the numbers of species that are kind of living uh, together and that need each other in order to um to be well nourished so I think um, that is a, a really um, interesting thing to see how different farmers um, approach that. Um, in in terms of what um, Alex was saying around, you know, shutting down industrial agriculture, it's it's one of the challenges I think for um, for small scale producers and anyone who's um, done any research on small scale farmers will know that, um, you know, the abattoir is kind of this really um, tricky spot where you can spend all this time being, you know. Um, small scale and regenerative and um, and free range and all of that and then it, all of that is kind of undone in this really brutal um, system and and of course farmers are increasingly being forced to go into really centralized abattoir systems um, and and so I've seen some emerging alternatives to abattoirs um, small scale multi-species abattoirs that are really interesting because they allow for um, moments of unexpected care. Um, so one of the, the abattoirs that I went to in New South Wales, um, the woman who was working there talked about how she blesses all the animals um, before they, they're slaughtered. And it's just a kind of like moment that she takes to kind of think about this particular creature and what it's about to go through and, um, and kind of honor that, I guess, in a way. Um, it's still gonna be killed, um, but there's, I guess some of the brutality is kind of stripped away from that. Um, and I, I see a lot of um, hope in those kinds of um, systems or alternatives, but you know they're also incredibly difficult to uh, to set up in the existing system. So um, yeah, don't know if that answers your question. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, Tori, I'm assuming you will wave at me if there are questions in the room. Otherwise, I'll just let the the, the zoom screens continue to dominate. We have got one question here in the room, so I'll let you. Um, should we go to go to that first, or do you want to take a couple yeah, of things? Yeah, sure. Go, go to the room, and then we'll go to David. Okay. Um, so we're just passing over the mic. Great. Right. This is very interesting. It's nice to see the offliners dominating the in presence people. It's it's a nice shift of power. So thank you for for um, uh, giving me the mic. My name is Nora McKeon, um, and uh, I, I'm very much in sympathy with. Uh, all of the speakers. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Uh, Tommaso Fernando is a good friend of mine, and I very much like Alex's uh, final uh, questioning. I, I would just like to suggest um, in a supportive way, a couple of things that come to my mind. I am uh, situated at the, the global food governance uh, level and very much in contact with working with facilitating the, um, the bringing the voices of uh, small scale producers and other constituencies to bear on decision making at, at, at various levels, including the global one. And I just wanted to suggest um, a couple of things. First of all, and this has been said, I think by Stu Stewart at the beginning, that, that, um, that hearing more voices from the global south would make a good contribution to the way we work through issues because I'm from the US myself, as you can uh, tell from my accent. And I, I think my, my, my hope for the food world uh, grew enormously when I went to school in Africa with the peasant farmers and you know, discovered that, that lettuce doesn't 
isn't born in cellophane packages. You know, there's a whole world out there. So, uh, and, and I would link that with uh, the idea of collective agency that our keynote speaker today was talking about the fact that that it's it's in it's not just individuals and their practices because practices can always be co-opted we're seeing that all the time but it's when there's collective agency and the collective agency is located in communities but beyond communities it's located in networks of 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 uh, small scale producers of rural women of you know uh, indigenous peoples, et cetera, et cetera. And they are the ones, Alex, I don't know to what degree you're, you're linked into this, but they are producing, they have produced, they exist, these uh, what are called alternatives, but are in fact are the, the, the mainstay of life in most of the global South. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, it's incorrect to call them alternatives. It's, it's the capitalist food system that is alternative, really. And they're the ones who are building up these uh, these uh, uh, other ways of doing things, which are not uh, fit for purpose now. I mean, all of I'm, I'm not denying any of the you know terrible aspects of the situation we're living, but they are there, and the the kind of um, uh, the, the the way in which they are identifying uh, the 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 difference between short term band aids that strengthen the, the existing situation and long-term transformational changes is, is uh, I, I think would be very useful for you. I, I, uh, I'm working in particular with, with, with um, African social movements where, for example, governments are uh, uh, giving land to uh, industrial wheat producers because we have, to, we have to produce wheat locally rather than saying, okay, forget about wheat, let's go back to sorghum, millet, you know, our, our, our crops, or the African Development Bank is uh, offering millions of dollars for importing chemical fertilizers, whereas these movements are advocating uh, subsidies for uh, domestic production of biofertilizers. And these things are happening now. In the, and, and I think the link really, really needs to, I'm sure all of you individually in your work are working with social movements, but I think also uh, more collectively, uh, it, it's important to do this. And this leads me to, to ask a naughty question that, that's been on my mind um, over the past couple of days, which is that I, I believe most of you or a lot of you are working with research grants, no? And um, the, the kind of research that I'm involved in, the people's research is totally unfunded. We've been talking a lot about co, co um, what do you call it, co-creation. Can we imagine that, that, that well-disposed researchers with access to research grants could co-create research programs that would bring together from the very beginning, from how you frame the question, what is it we want to ask? What, you know, uh, bring together the kind of people's evidence that can be accessed and the kind of wonderful uh, theoretical and analytic uh, inputs that academics can make. So I'll end there. Thank you so much, Nora. They were um, really very, very well taken, um, wonderful provocations. And I think you're getting us thinking um, about alternate ways of organizing globally quite clearly um, in, in the way you put those comments to us. Would any of the panelists like to respond? Mel, I might jump in Please. Uh, quickly. Yeah. Um, Thank you. They, I, yeah, I'm, I'm fully, fully in step with with all of those the, the questions and comments and, and the provocations that that you offer there. I mean, if I could do a little um, a little bit of a shout out for I think one of the the papers uh, chapters in the book that I think really engages some of these issues um, in really interesting ways is um, the chapter by John Altman and Francis Markham. I'm not sure if either John or, or Francis are, are with us um, today, but their work um, is situated in remote Indigenous communities, communities that have, through the operations of very punitive government-led welfare systems, been involved um, and kind of and drawn into 
um, very time consuming, um, a, a quite kind of oppressive systems of, of what we call work for the dole, of kind of a forced employment in order to, to access welfare payments. And one of the things that they draw out that happened during the pandemic was that those systems were effectively suspended because of you know, the state of emergency. And so they engage this idea of disruption as reprieve because what happened was actually this space opened up for creative and active re-engagement with, um, with the traditional long-standing forms of food provision um, and sustenance that um, were all around them, um, but which had been effectively kind of, um, uh, if not foreclosed, kind of limited and, and disciplined um, previously through this kind of government regime. So it was this moment actually of kind of crack and rupture that really, I think, illuminated the possibilities for, um, as you know, as you talk about in your own work, Nora, kind of food systems that are outside of, of these dominant logics, but are in so many ways, the food systems that sustain the majority. Thanks, Tori. Okay, David Giles, you've been waiting very patiently. Uh, where are we? Well, there's a lot to listen uh, patiently to and probably uh, more exciting and more interesting than anything I'm going to say. So patience is, uh, patience is appropriate. <laughs> but, um, I suppose I had a, just a quick question for everyone uh, on the panel, but in response to Alex's comment, uh, I really appreciate the provocation at the end of Alex's comments about uh, thinking in terms of abolition. You know, the, and, and, I'm, and I'm not sure how, uh, how much uh, was invested in that particular word choice, but it's become a, a more and more common catch cry across resistant social movements. Uh, and it has its origins, of course, in responses to specific kinds of uh, organised state violence. So, you know, the, the abolition movement uh, against slavery is uh, directly invoked by the current uh, movement for prison abolition. So it's all the kind of subjectivity of people uh, invoking abolition grows out of a relationship to the state. But then the term seems to be uh, proliferating and its implications seem to be proliferating too. Uh, and so I, I wonder what it means to think abolition in terms not of specific state practices, but in terms of whole industries uh, or whole modes of industry. And I wonder what... Uh, what abolition as or abolitionism uh, as a, a subjective relationship to power means for food systems. So it's a long rambly sort of preamble to the question, what does abolition mean to, uh, to the stakeholders that all of you are writing uh, with, about and from? I'm hearing that question is firstly being posed to Alex. Yeah, I'll start us um, perhaps not with a satisfactory answer, but um, with sympathy to the, the, the question. Um, partly invoking abolition in that way was deliberate in part because I do think things like industrial meat production are state projects at some level, um, both through the shifting forms of legislation that are necessary to keep them in the world um, to the massive amounts of, of both agricultural and labor-based subsidies that have allowed these systems to grow and grow in the United States, but also with actually direct links to things like prisons, right? Um, huge um, swaths of plants in the United States function in large part through things like prison labor. At the same time, you know, I was thinking about that question quite a bit. What's it mean to abolish an entire sector, an entire industry, uh, or to shift from um, abolition of public sector things to the private sector. And I was thinking about it specifically in the case of the very well publicized outbreaks and deaths um, um, in the rural United States around meatpacking plants and their comparative lack or the, the, the comparative lack of protests that arose around them, right? Um, at one level, we did see in, in ways that totally surprised me as an ethnographer of, of slaughterhouses. We saw like in the example of the children of Smithfield in Nebraska, 
um, kids of meatpacking workers holding protests in parking lots, trying to explicitly say that these jobs are not worth their parents' lives, that, that G these jobs, um, you know, at some level are, 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 should not exist in their current form. Um, but I was surprised at the degree to which um, those stories kind of quickly passed and, um, or at least wanted to begin thinking or imagining what would it mean to break down, say, rural and urban, public and private divides to, um, you know, see forms of protest ensure, see forms of, of outright the resistance emerge when, you know, the state essentially declares workers killable um, and primarily um, workers of color, primarily from the global south killable. So I think it's important work to think along the intersections and the divides, but I'm admittedly just starting to, to think of it. Lauren. Thanks, David, for that provocation. I think it's um, absolutely essential. And if I, you know, read um, the intent of abolition to tackle these structural and systemic injustices, then I think, you know, it's absolutely a crucial lens to bring to this question of global supply chain disruption, because it forces us to look beyond what seem to be those proximate causes of disruption to understand that the impacts are co-created by all of these um, unjust, unsustainable, um, deeply violent structures. And there's a huge um, synergy here with emerging approaches in climate change adaptation and to climate change resilience, really trying to take a um, abolitionist approach to climate justice. And so what that would mean in this case would be not to necessarily see, you know, the flood, the storm, even COVID as the issue that needs to be dealt with here, but to tackle directly those things that are exposed um, including uh, the kind of normalization of disruption within these um, structures as well, that kind of daily violence, the everyday violence um, that people have to cope with. And so, yeah, I thank for that provocation. I think that's a really useful direction for us. We are coming close to the end of our allocated time. Is there anybody else who would like to raise something? Um, we've got a question here, Mel. Uh, thank you very much. Not a question, more a comment. My name is Hilde Birker and I really enjoyed this session. So thank you so much for brilliant presentation of this important and timely collection, which really flows nicely or in an extension of Nora McKeon's talk uh, this Wednesday here. So I think, yeah, you really highlight very well how corporations, financial actors strengthen their positions during crisis and with the support of the UN and with the support of uh, public regulation. So I'd be happy to join welcoming the collapse or change <laughs> of industrial production, um, uh, industrial production of meats, which I also want to add a comment that it's really made a huge impression when when I like springs animal bodies into the equation. So, which is not often done. So I think that's an important uh, highlighting as well. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to be part of the work. To say also using Alex word champion alternatives. So. Thank you. Well, um... This is probably the moment to thank everybody for joining us. Thank our, our fabulous um, panel and contributors to the book, especially those of you who are joining us either very late at night or very, very early in the morning. Um, sorry to those of you in Cairns that we are not there with you in person. Um, these strange um, uh, ways of, of meeting and not meeting continue. But on the, on the other hand, it's been marvellous to be able to reconnect with people we had such a wonderful workshop with last year and to be able to bring people from all sorts of parts of the country together today and indeed um, the world. Um, so thanks a lot. Please do share our book around as widely as, as you feel inclined. It is free to download as, as you can see. Um, and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Back to you, Tori.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Melinda. Thanks, everyone. It is indeed very nice to be so globally connected as we also try and think beyond the global. Um, great. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I will. Um, let me let me pop up the slide, which has the, the QR code on it for anyone. Anyone wanting that? Mm -hmm. 